quickly as going to the introduction, Our Father who art in heaven. When we say the words, Our Father, it is a statement of relationship. It is a statement of faith. You're saying, Our Father. You're talking to someone you're related to. And so it's a statement of relationship. It's a statement of love. And it is also a statement of faith. When we say, Who art in heaven, we're talking about the present residency of the king, our father. He lives in heaven. He does not live here on earth. He made earth for us. He made it perfect. He was here at one time, but because of sin, now he is left, and he is up in what would probably call the third heavens. And so when we talk about God's residence, it is our Father who art in heaven. What's a simple definition of heaven? Really three things. There is no sin, there is no separation, and this is a great phrase, there's no Satan. Isn't that great? When you just think of it, the one who has just messed up things so, so well, and we have cooperated with him so well, it's just not going to be there. There's going to be no sin, no separation, and no Satan. The first petition is to be, hallowed be thy name. Now, nothing is more important in the Lord's Prayer than to hallow his name. And when God is putting these seven petitions together, he puts this first. There is a reason for that. We are to hallow the name of, the Lord, of our Father. And either we will hallow his name or we'll make hollow. There's only one letter difference. Hallow is H-A-L-L-O-W. And to make hollow is H-O-L-L-O-W. To hallow the name of Jesus Christ means to exalt, to lift up. It means to treat as holy the name of God. And when you hollow out something, is you're emptying out the substance, the meaning of something. And so we are to come into God's presence and to say, Father, I prize your name. I desire that, that your name would be recognized not only in heaven, but also here on earth by all people. And Father, it's my desire that your name would be treated as holy, that you'd be recognized as the only God that would have no more of Buddha and Confucius and Shinto and all the other religions of the world. That you would stand as preeminent, you would stand alone, and that the world would recognize that your son, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God and no one else. God, I pray the competition is going to be over, that your will will be done. That's what we're praying when we pray, hallowed be thy name. Remember I taught you the Hebrew phrase for the word hallow? It's yit kaddish. Yit kaddish. To treat as holy his name. When we're asking that his name be treated as holy, you're asking for four things spiritually. Father, I'm asking that your name would be believed. Secondly, that you would be feared properly around the world. That people, thirdly, would keep your commandments, that you would be believed and obeyed. And then fourthly, that you would be glorified. What's the implications when you pray something like that? What we're really saying is, Father, I want you to be believed around the world. I want you to be trusted. I want us to get away from this philosophy and apologetics and any kind of defense and where we have to, where it just seems that we're a minimum people and, and it's always going uphill and we're always trying to defend Christianity. God, I, I just want that to, to be over and that you would be believed, that you would be feared, that you would be obeyed and that you would be glorified. The implications of that, when you pray that, it's a very serious prayer. Because what we need to realize is that to pray those things, we need to live, first of all, separate from the world. And then secondly, we need to be willing to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. That if it comes for a time of abuse or a time of persecution or whatever it comes, that we will uphold the name of our Father. That we are Christians. 
that no matter what cost it will come, that we'll be willing to not only be separated from the world, but to pay any price so that his name will always be lifted up. And this has been done by martyrs throughout the centuries of time. And you've always probably wondered and said, how does a person muster up that kind of faith and theology? It's because these individuals, especially in past history, knew the, 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 knew the theology of the Lord's Prayer. And if they'd been praying their whole life to hallow his name, they weren't going to give in and then hollow his name and continue living. That they'd rather hallow his name and die for his cause than to continue on. The second petition in reference to the Lord's Prayer is that thy kingdom would come. It's the shortest sentence in the Lord's Prayer. And it's interesting that in the Greek, it's imperative. This is a command. And so Jesus is teaching us that when we come to the Father and we say, thy kingdom come, we're very simply saying this, let it happen. Let it actually take place. And thirdly, let it actually come. Let it come now. And so we're praying that that God's way, His will, His word would become paramount here on earth. And so that rather than thinking that we're losing and that the light is going out and there's more darkness, that we'd just be encouraged and saying, God, you're winning. You're winning in my heart. And, and, And you're winning around the world. The church really is a church triumphant. The implications are that when we pray, thy kingdom come, is that we're living for a king. That we're living for a king. And in living for a king, it means that there's going to be compliance in our lives and servanthood. Those two things. That there's going to be compliance and there's going to be servanthood. What do I mean by that? It means that self-centered living should be forever gone. Secondly, that selfish independence should be gone. And thirdly, that selfishness is replaced with submission. So when we're praying, thy kingdom come, we're praying, Father, you're the king, and we want your kingdom to come. And let it start in my heart this day that I recognize that rather be, than being a person who wanders this life in an aimless way, trying to do the best that I can, trying to be religious, that you have saved my soul, you have made me whole. I am now a Christian. You have given me the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And my task is to glorify you in absolutely everything that I think, what I see, what I read, what I do, what I speak, every step I take, everything, every relationship is going to be related to you. It's going to be directed by you because I want thy will to be done, your kingdom to come. And if it's not happening anywhere else, let it happen in my heart and in the heart of my wife and in my child and in in my relatives. And then together we'll expand your kingdom. It's such a powerful, powerful petition. And Father, for that to happen, it means that I'm going to be submissive, that I'm going to be obedient. And when I fail you, and I know it's going to happen, because I'm just so prone to sin and I love sinning more often than being righteous, that, Father, I'm going to come to you and say, would you forgive me? I want a new start, and I want to be in alignment with what you have to do. We come now to the third petition. Thy will be done. It's in reference to authority. Thy will be done. It's in reference to locality. Where? On earth. It's talking about capacity. It says, as in heaven. Let's go to that word then, authority. Thy will be done. What are we saying when we pray those words? We're saying that our Father's name is supreme above every name. That there are no other kingdoms that even match His kingdom. We're saying that God is the rightful ruler